everybody. Um, my name is Maureen Shea. I'm the Vice Principal for Humanities and Social Sciences here. And it's my very pleasant duty this evening to welcome you all and to introduce uh, Kathy McElwain, who's inaugural lecture we're about to hear. Um, Kathy is a graduate of the University of Liverpool uh, with a BA in Geography and an MA in Latin American Studies. And she's also a graduate and a PhD from the LSE. And she joined QNUL, as we were just remembering earlier, in 1994. So this is kind of 21st birthday as well as in order. Um, and she has been a very much valued collegial colleague since that time. And she was promoted to a chair in geography in 2012. So we don't rush to our inaugurals here. We give everybody time to reflect before they um, give you their research to you. And Cathy's research is rooted in development geography. And she works on transnational migration and on north-south linkages. She's undertaken a fascinating series of research projects working with a wide range of collaborators, I'm sure many of whom are here this evening, and funded by diverse external bodies. And I just wanted to talk through a little bit of the range of what Cathy's focused on, because I think it's such an interesting range of projects that have some common themes, but also some differences. So, for example, she had a project that she was involved in called Global Cities at Work, Migrant Labour in Low-Paid Employment in London, uh, which she did with colleagues in geography, Kavita Data, John May and Jane Wills. Um, and this ESRC-funded project explored the importance of migrant labour in global cities, focusing on the experiences, practices and politics of workers in low-paid sectors of London's labour market, mainly focused on cleaning, care and construction industries. Then there was a project called No Longer Invisible, the Latin American Community in London, this was funded by the Trust for London and the Latin American Women's Rights Service. And the project explored the nature, need and problems of the Latin American community in London. It was the first large-scale research project based on a questionnaire survey with over 1,000 people and a range of in-depth interviews and focus group discussions. And it also generated, importantly, an estimate of the size of the Latin American population in London, which I don't know, but Cathy might tell us later. Another project was on mapping corporate philanthropy and community engagement in East London, which was done with Alison Blunt, Alistair Owens, Jane Wills and Joanna Wadsley. This was funded by Queen Mary's Centre for Public Engagement and it identified the main ways that corporations and philanthropic individuals engage with the communities of East London and through various types of corporate <coughs> social responsibility <coughs> initiatives. Then another project on transnational voting practices among Colombian migrants, which focused on the Colombian 2010 elections. Um, and it, this was a British Academy-funded research project, which examined the external voting patterns among Colombian migrants living in the UK and in Spain in relation to the legislative and presidential elections in 2010. It identified the motivations behind migrants' participation in home country elections, as well as the barriers to the exercise of the external vote. And then, most recently, a project which I think she will talk about this evening, No Longer Invisible, Revisited, Onward Latin American Migrants in London. And this is built on the research undertaken as part of the No Longer Invisible. Um, and the project firstly provides an up-to-date analysis of the size and socioeconomic characteristics of the Latin American community in London, and then secondly, outlines the nature of secondary onward migration flows of Latin Americans from mainland Europe and especially from Spain, Portugal and Italy, which have grown hugely since 2008. So as well as all that fascinating range of research projects, Cathy has also made outstanding contributions to teaching as well as to the leadership of teaching and learning in the School of Geography, where she served as director of taught programmes and has also offered a range of modules in globalisation, gender and development at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. She's regularly been nominated by students for a Draper's Award for teaching, and she's also lectured at schools and universities throughout the UK, as well as in Brazil. She has also an exceptional track record of public engagement through consultancy work on various aspects of development and collaborative research with third sector organisations, as well as a wide range of media activities. So I'm delighted to welcome Cathy to come up and to present her inaugural lecture, From Latin America to Latin London, Negotiating Invisible Geographies of International Migration. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and um, thanks to everyone who's here this evening, but particularly my family, um, my boys Max and Alex, my partner Michael and his mum Pat, my aunt and uncle, um, John and Ben, who've come from Geneva, um, my brother Fraser's come from Ireland, Angie, my sister-in-law, um, my nephew and niece, James and Sophie. Um, and also, all you who've come to, to listen to me tonight, um, I hope you, you enjoy, the, um, enjoy the evening. In terms of um, what I'd like, and thank you also, Morag, for, for giving such a wonderful introduction, and I will be picking up on, on quite a lot of the themes that, that you've mentioned. Um, in terms of what I'll be talking about tonight, there's three core areas that, um, that I'm going to speak to. Uh, collaboration, uh, invisibilities, and Latin American London geographies. Specifically in relation to collaboration, I want to talk about journeys, and journeys is a real theme of the evening. Um, this is really about how you do research, the collaborative process or the method and the methodological process of doing, um, doing research. So this is about journeys with friends, with colleagues, organisations, disciplines, and with research participants. And I'll pick up on these things as, as I go through, um, go through the lecture. Secondly, I want to think theoretically about this idea of invisibilities. Um, and also, particularly in relation to this notion of travelling theories, as well as intellectual journeys, my own intellectual journey, and how that fits into to wider debates. Um, so I want to think about conceptualising invisibilities, but also acting on invisibilities, and thinking politically um, in relation to um, migration in, in, in particular. Then finally, there's also been a sort of empirical journey, um, and it's been journeys across borders. It's been journeys from Latin America to London, and also transnationally in terms of maintaining those links between Latin America and with the United Kingdom, and also with Spain. More, I mentioned Spain, and I will be, will be talking about that. The music, which I heard there was lots of noise before I came in, um, the, the, there, was, there was a significance to the music that you heard as you, were, as you were coming in. And it's actually a song that was composed and performed by Pablo Torres, who is the Chilean husband of one of my very lovely PhD, former PhD <coughs> students, I should say. She's currently um, um, at, the, at the LSE. And he wrote this song called Mariposa del Sur, which means Butterfly of the South in relation to a documentary film that I made with Mark Evans, who's also here this evening, on the basis of the most recent research project that I'll be talking about. And in many ways, I think this, the, the, the lyrics of, of this song are um, very poignant and very relevant to what I'll be talking about this evening. And particularly this idea at the end, she comes from the South and she brings the South with her. And in particular, the, the lyrics relate to Yelitsa, who is from Venezuela, who's in the middle. But the other people um, around um, Yelitsa are Erica, who's from Colombia, Mari Carmen, who's from Ecuador, Tommy, who's originally from Nicaragua, but brought up in, in, in Bolivia, and then Andrea, who is from, um, who is from Brazil. So that's sort of setting things up, but I also, obviously having been here, as, as Morag said, for 21 years, I wanted to say something about what I've called the hidden geographies of appointment. How did I end up here um, this evening, 21 years after I, I was first appointed, actually by Philip Ogden, who's sitting in the front row, we were reminiscing earlier about that. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and I think a quite a poignant story, um, the, the photograph on the left is from Coyoacan in Mexico City. And that's actually where I was when Nigel Spence managed to track me down via a very great friend of mine, Sylvia Chant, to Mexico City. I still don't know how Sylvia ever found the phone number of where I was staying. No idea. Um, but she did, and I applied, and the rest is, is, is history. And so I thought it was quite, quite interesting that a few weeks ago... Um, we saw this piece of rather wonderful graffiti of Frida Kahlo, very close by in Hackney Wick. 
And I thought, given that I've ended up, I started in Coyoacana, Mexico City, in terms of my Queen Mary journey. And um, Hackney, as most of you will know, is down the road here from, from, from Queen Mary. And there is Frida, this wonderful feminist icon, who's from Coyoacan in Mexico, and that's where the Frida Kahlo Museum is. And there she is in the, in the graffiti between Zamo Household Products and the Thames Engineering <laughs> Services. <laughs> so, slightly more seriously, the conceptualisation. Um, these are th this is a theme that will run through the lecture, and it's really about thinking about the, the ambivalence and ambiguity surrounding what invisibility means. So what I want to show as I go through is the idea of invisibility as being dynamic, as being enforced from above and below, and the range of different power relations inherent in that. And then also visibility, the other side of invisibility, visibility as threat, Visibility is ensuring access to resources and being political, and particularly visibility as resistance. And really, the sort of the, the empirical basis surrounding that, and more I talked about that um, in her introduction, has been throughout my career in relation to thinking about women and gender issues, um, thinking about poverty, urban violence, low paid migrant workers. Um, and with the Latin American migrants, but also in a frame of sort of injustice and transformation. The other thing that I just, again, uh, I'm going to, to talk a little bit about is sort of disaggregating and thinking about the debates around what visibility and invisibility mean. Foucault um, talked about this in the 1970s, and it's quite an old um, debate now, focusing around the idea of the model prisoner, what he called the panopticon. And he based that on Jeremy Bentham's work, um, where it's the idea of a, a circular prison with a tower in the middle where everybody is surveilled. Um, and, and the person in the tower in the middle can basically enforce their power from the tower and look at all the prisoners. And so this idea that Foucault talks about, which is a, it's a diagram of the mechanism of power reduced to its ideal form. But what I want to show, and again this is a 1970s debate, is that we need to think um, about visibility and invisibility in more paradoxical ways. And this is a rather nice idea of bringing us to, the, to Latin America and to the Americas, and it's, it's um, thanks to Caroline Moser um, here that um, she pointed this out to me. Um, Cuba built a model prison in 1926 on the Isla de Pinos, which is now called, or has been renamed, the Isla de la Juventud, which is the, the um, island of youth. And in, um, in the 1950s, Fidel Castro and his brother Raul were incarcerated there. And that was following the Moncado barracks attack, which marked the start of the Cuban Revolution. And the photo here on, on the right at the bottom is actually Fidel uh, when he was released from prison. And the panopticon in Cuba actually became a symbol of, res of revolution. So it wasn't the case of the state imposing power. Actually, Castro and Raul turned this visibility idea on its, on its head. Thinking more about Latin America and the way that we produce knowledge about Latin America is this idea of epistemic violence. And what I'm thinking about here is really the importance of, and, and myself and, um, and uh, lots of my, my collaborators, um, have tried to think about the way in which we need to challenge uh, the, sort of the imposition of Anglo-American geographic and, and development concepts to explain processes in Latin America. And... Um, there's a Colombian anthropologist, very well-known anthropologist, called Arturo Escobar, who published a book in, in, um, in the 1990s, 1995, called Encountering Development. And this was a critique of uh, the development process, and in particular, the way that this idea of development erases difference within the Global South and represents deficiencies or absences, and that is remedied through the imposition of Western development. So this is one of the research projects actually that Morag didn't talk about, but it was very formative in that it was in Colombia and also in Guatemala. And obviously you can see the encounter, it was called, it resulted in a book called Encounters um, with Violence in Latin America. And it was a project directed um, by Caroline Moser. 
Um, and it, it very much relates to Escobar's idea about the need to focus on local realities and resistance to imposing external uh, um, agendas. And what the project looked at was the, the nature of, of urban violence in conflict, which is Colombia, and post-conflict Guatemala settings. But the key thing here was looking at um, perspectives from poor people themselves. And what we found actually challenged a lot of the dominant agendas at the time, which was focused very much on political violence and conflict and post-conflict. What we found was that every day, economic and social um, urban violence were actually more important in the eyes of, of the urban poor. But obviously that they were interrelated. What we also tried to do, you can see on the left, is that we also published the work um, so it wasn't only published in, in, in English, which is the one on the right, but the, the book on the right, but we also published versions in, in Colombia and we published them in, in Guatemala. And again, this was very much a collaborative research um, process with 18 civil society organisations and local academic groups in, in both countries. This is also an, an example, and it comes directly from this piece of research, and it's, called a, it's part of what we call participatory urban appraisal, but this was done in Bogota with six, um, six people in this community in, in, uh, in Bogota. And basically it highlights, when you ask people themselves what are the main issues um, affecting, affecting your lives, we don't see political violence, we don't see armed conflict, we do see drugs, we do see stealing cars, we see robbery, we see gangs, we see lack of, uh, lack of security. So using these types of methodologies and actually speaking to people themselves really highlights um, uh, the, the, the real experiences of what is happening on the ground. I should also say as well that um, partly in relation to the work that, that, that we did in Colombia, I've also been a trustee of um, a wonderful organisation called Children Change Colombia who work with vulnerable children um, in Colombia. And... Um, uh, they, they work very much on a lot of the issues that Caroline and I looked at, and Caroline's actually currently the, the chair of Children Change Columbia. So if you see any fundraisers for Children Change Columbia, please give generously. <laughs> so collaboration, the production of knowledge and field work. I've talked about the, sort of the politics of creating, um, creating knowledge, but it's incredibly important, and I think you've probably gathered that by now, that um, in order to, um, to conduct what, what's often been called responsible learning and ethical knowledge production, we have to do inductive, engaged, and collaborative fieldwork. This is important in, in relation to the type of research that I've been talking about, but also in terms of pedagogy, and particularly in terms of teaching. Um, and say so the two sides on the right are from a field trip that I took um, more than 21 years ago, even further back than that, to, to Jamaica as a third-year student when I was doing my undergraduate degree in, in, in Liverpool. And it was incredibly important and really formative in terms of deciding to look at, um, uh, at whole issues of international um, development. The other thing that I think that we often ignore when we, we talk about the, the production of knowledge and the fieldwork process is um, what I've called the sort of the invisible stories. The photographs on the side come from um, Costa Rica 89, as we call it, as a, as a sort of a, a, a shortcut. And this was a research project which was directed by, by Sylvia Chant and another great friend of mine, Sarah Bradshaw. We went to work with her as um, research assistants before we did our PhDs. And Sylvia worked us very hard, and this is... Sarah and I, and also Sylvia, Sylvia didn't go to bed, she stayed up with us as well, into the middle of the night um, doing the coding of the survey. So we spent all day walking around this community, and then at night we had to sit down and um, code all the data. This was the days of papers and pens. We didn't have, as you can see, no computers in those days. So these are very formative processes, but also I think in terms of the notion of invisibility, it's really important to think about how we create knowledge. So the top left-hand um, um, image there is a map that I drew from my PhD research, which was also in Costa Rica, but it's of all the houses where I interviewed. They, there are no maps of these, of these places. These are low-income barriers. 
The bottom are some field notes, actually from a place called Pentecico de Julio, which is this community here. So this is pre-PhD. The other thing, again, when I was putting together the slide, is that um, I, I went back to the first thing that I ever got published, which was in 1995, which makes me, does, does make me feel very old. And I wrote then, and I've completely forgotten this, that I'd, I talked about the interrelationships between um, gender, race and class, and I'd argued back then that um, we need to recognise the intersections between gender, race and class, but that the driving force behind this work came from people in the developing world, and that then this needed to be brought forward into the, into the policy community. The other thing, again, about fieldwork is it's about, feel, I feel like it's about feminism, it's about friendships, and it's also about fun. Um, I've also worked um, with, other, uh, with other colleagues. On the top um, right-hand uh, slide is another really um, close friend and colleague, Kavita Data, and that is Kavita in a Shabin in South Africa. And we did a project in, um, in South Africa and Botswana, it's like quite a long time ago now. And this is Sylvia and I in the Philippines. Again, I will be talking uh, a project that we did in the Philippines I will be talking about today. And top left is, is Caroline and I in Colombia. And then this is the fun bit. Sylvia let us, let us go to the beach at the weekends as long as we got all our coding done. So this is what we were allowed to do on, on Saturdays and Sundays. Although I think I recall, Sarah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we still had to stay up all night, even on the beach. And Sylvia said, it's OK, you can sleep on the beach during the day. So this is a place called Manuel Antonio in Costa Rica. In line with this idea of how we create knowledge, I feel very strongly that it's very important to make visible the research collaborators, um, and particularly working with civil society. This is something that has gone through um, that my whole career. Um, uh, and particularly some of the, the organisations that I still work with, actually along the bottom, Latin American Women's Rights Service that I'll be talking about, the CASA Latin American Theatre Festival, and CARILA. And on the left-hand side, these are, these are collaborators. This is, a, this is from Guatemala, and also the, the bottom um, slide there is actually from, a, from Carilla, which is based in the Holloway Road in London. So it's really important to think about valorising local knowledge and ways of knowing, but also research participants themselves. So talking to people, finding out, it's like the creation of, of, of the map of, of the community which is otherwise unmapped. And I think by doing this um, and, and, and working and, and viewing research participants as agents, we uncover hidden issues. So on the left-hand side, we can see um, a, a, a diagram that was, that was conducted with um, six people who talked about what it's like to live in London without immigration papers. Types of issues that it's actually very hard to, to think about and to find out about um, without doing this type of work. Um, even more um, disturbing is the image on the right, which is from Guatemala. And this was some work that we did with children where we asked them what they were afraid of. And this 13-year-old girl said well, she, she, what she was afraid of, that somebody would rape her. This really highlights, very, very poignantly, I think, the importance of sexual violence amongst young people and what they're afraid of. Coming back to this idea of, of um, theorising from, the, um, from the global south, this is something I think that, that, um, that we've done very much and it's a, certainly a theme of the work that, that, that we do at Queen Mary in the School of Geography, particularly my colleague um, Al James, um, who's no longer here and is now in Newcastle, but he's been um, uh, working very strongly in terms of, of, of highlighting this issue as well as, as, as Kavita. Um, and Sylvia and I tried to do this in uh, a, a recent book that we published this year where we tried to argue that we were the <coughs> theorising um, uh, urbanisation from the, 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 van uh, the vantage point of non-Northern context. So in other words, we were not just taking the Global South as a case study and extrapolating from that, but we were actually theorising from the Global South. Another thing that, that's, that's been very important and something that... Um, I've done with, again, very valued colleagues and friends at Queen Mary, and more I've mentioned this project, which is Global Cities at Work, which is with Jane Wills, um, John May, Kavita Data, Yara Evans and Joe Herbert. And what we did there is that we took the theoretical frameworks 
developed in the Global South and use them to understand or try and understand um, the experiences of international migrants in London. And again, I think it's interesting to think about the lyrics of the song again. You know, she comes from the South and she brings the South with her, Mariposa del Sur. Okay, moving on then to look at invisibility in relation to um, the city, particularly in terms of London, but in the city uh, more generally. And on the one hand, migrants really need recognition, and I'll talk about uh, this in, in a moment. But on the other hand, sometimes they also need to remain hidden. Um, this whole notion of invisibility is very much linked with um, the evolution of race relation debates, um, and also the idea of um, visibility as resistance and using uh, material objects as symbols of visibility. And a really interesting one here is Elephant and Castle. Elephant and Castle is uh, an area of London uh, very much associated with the Latin American population. I'll say something about this again in, in a moment. But the interesting thing here, thinking about visibility and invisibility, is that there's an urban myth about the elephant in Elephant and Castle, which says that it's named after the Infanta de Castilla, who married Charles I. This sounds like a very, very interesting urban myth. Actually, it was named after a pub. Um, <laughs> not only was it named after a pub, but anything that you look at, try and find out information about um, Elephant and Castle and how it was named, very rarely, if ever, mentions the fact that it's painted in the flags, the colours of the flags of Colombia and Ecuador to, to signify that this is a Latin American area, very much associated with Latin Americans. So also, visibility is, is, can be seen as a threat to status quo and ethnic harmony. It's very much linked with demands on public services and also belonging. <coughs> And then the sort of other thing, and this very much I think relates to London as, as a global city, and it links with the research that we did um, in, in relation to um, global cities at work. But in, in many ways, cities, like global cities like London are, are very much sort of seen as sanctuaries and home for strangers, home for migrants. Migrants, until very, very recently, um, have, have, have often generally been welcomed in a city like London. But these are also spaces of exploitation and discrimination. Okay, moving on then to think about the sort of the empirical part of my, my slice of pie. Um, the two projects that Morag mentioned at the beginning, no longer invisible on the left, and then actually the newest project, which we're launching next month, hasn't actually been launched yet, is called Towards Visibility. And... Um, as more I've mentioned at the beginning, these sort of two major projects have been really about trying to raise the profile of the Latin American community in London as it has grown. Um, and so in terms of thinking about, you know, who are Latin Americans, they're a very recent migrant group. Two-thirds have arrived since 2000. This doesn't mean to say that there weren't really important groups before then, because there were. There were exiles, particularly Colombian and Chilean exiles, refugees, um, often um, Colombians, um, fleeing the armed conflict. But the majority now tend to be economic migrants. And in the 2011 census, the two main groups were Brazilians and Colombians. And as I said, the, the, the majority migrate for um, economic, uh, in search of better economic opportunities. And in many ways, say the you can see the titles of the two different projects, one undertaken in 2011, the other are published in 2011, the other about to be published next month, is this idea that we're moving towards visibility, which I think is true, but it's not as clear-cut as that. These are these rather wonderful maps drawn by Ed Oliver, who's the cartographer in the, in the, uh, the School of Geography. And a lot of the work that, that we've been doing, um, and say more I've mentioned this, is making Latin Americans empirically visible through population estimates. And here I've really got to thank Brian Lineker and Diego Bouquet, who I, without, with, without whom I could never have done that. I have, and they'll both attest the fact that I'm really rubbish at um, doing the population estimate. So they very much helped me with... Um, coming up with these calculations, which basically show that there are a quarter of a million Latin Americans um, in the UK as of uh, 2013, the majority of whom reside in London. 
So this work has really been about putting Latin Americans on the map, literally, in terms of where do they live. Um, it's also very significant, I think, that Latin Americans are the second fastest growing non-EU migrant population in London. There are concentrations in Southwark and Lambeth, um, which is where um, Elephant and Castle is located, as well as Islington, Haringey, Seven Sisters Market, for example, is a, another hub of, of, of um, Latin American population. Brent and, um, and Newham and also Tower Hamlets. Another sort of key issue that I've been working on in relation to visibility and invisibility relates to immigration status, and particularly the ways in which migration regimes create irregularity and irregularity, but also visibility and invisibility. And what I've tried to do is really challenge this binary of somebody being legal or illegal and think about it as much more dynamic. People move in and out of, of irregularity or legality, de often depending on the vagaries of the immigration regime. So you can have a change in the law and somebody will become illegal overnight. However, in relation to Latin Americans, um, it's really important, and this comes from the no longer invisible work, the vast majority of Latin Americans arrive with legal documentation. So these are not people arriving um, you know, in, on, on the Eurostar and in the back of lorries. They come legally, but they often become irregular by overstaying, overstaying their visas. There's some examples here of a Bolivian, um, an Ecuadorian, and, and a Colombian. Now, as of, the, as of 2011 nearly 20% of uh, Latin Americans were, were without papers. They were irregular. Um, often, or the vast majority, were overstayers. But this has since shifted, and this has been the subject of the Towards Visibility work, this has since shifted to the main flows coming from other European countries, mainly from Spain. Primarily legally, as, um, as regularised uh, EU Spanish citizens, but also illegally in terms of using false Spanish passports. And this has been the subject of um, other work that I've been doing about thinking about how these new spaces and new geometries have been created in relation to changes in the immigration regime. So we have Latin Americans in 2011, and this has increased since then, more than a third of Latin Americans entered in 2010-2011 via Spain, and the, the, the vast majority are now um, arriving in this way. These are, and the interesting thing, these are invisible um, Latin Americans because they arrive as Spanish citizens. Um, and so in m many statistics, and again, we don't know, um, uh, it, it, it depends on the type of statistics, um, that uh, Latin Americans will be counted as Spanish on the basis of their nationality, if they have Spanish nationality. And it's only the statistics that identify the country of birth that we actually find out that they are Latin Americans. So what I tried to do, and again, thinking about this theme of theorising back, is taking um, livelihood and asset-based research from the Global South, mixing it in with a bit of Bourdieu, and um, uh, thinking about capital negotiating practices through trans the creation of transnational social spaces. So how do you create civic capital? How do you get a, a, an EU passport? Um, uh, how do you secure and develop economic capital? How do you get jobs in London? How do you develop economic, uh, sorry, social capital through social networks? And then also very interestingly, and I'll come back to this, is um, institutional cultural capital, which Bourdieu talks about in many ways, but one of the key ones is language. And many people come from Spain to the UK because they think that they, being able to speak English and learning English will be a really valuable asset for them. And particularly what they call el inglés puro, which is pure English, and that signif signifies basically non-gringo, non-US, non-North American English, which has more status in the Americas than, um, sorry, which has less status in the Americas than English English. The, the problem is, is that it then creates, language then beca has become one of the key barriers to, um, to the sort of integration and, um, and a key aspect of exploitation of Latin Americans in, in London. So in terms of thinking about um, the effects of this migration on the city of London, um, there's two ways of, of thinking about sort of visible and invisible settlement. 
On the one hand, Latin Americans are changing the urban landscape in London. Um, I don't know, you, you probably don't notice, but you know, I notice all the time the creation of the, you know, Latin American shops, cafes, restaurants popping up all over London. Um, obviously, particularly in places like Elephant and Castle and several si Seven Sisters, but in lots of other places as well. You can see it in Hackney, um, in Newham. Um, and this hasn't been without its problems as well. And um, here we've got uh, the um, reference to Latin Elephant, which is a charity which has been set up by Patria Roman to try and deal with the regeneration process um, of Latin Elephant, but other urban regeneration processes in London which often um, result in having uh, Latin American shops having to close down or to translate to other places. Um, and Patrice and, 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 and her team have been doing a really great job in trying to, to study that and work with the, um, with the business owners. And I'm also a, a trustee of, of Latin Elephant as well. So on the one hand, it's changing the, the, sort of the urban morphology of the city, but also if uh, one is an irregular migrant, um, the idea of invisibility is actually um, affects how you experience the city. And so a lot of the people um, in, in my research often talk about you know, not going to particular places, staying close to home, um, having limits on their mobility. And this is, a, again, a really interesting case of um, a Bolivian who talks about... Um, places like Elephant and Castle as where it's full of lots of immigration people. And these are very much often seen as zones of conflict and ambivalence, although uh, the no longer invisible research showed that 85% of Latin Americans actually go to these places, but they don't particularly necessarily like them. So there's a lot of ambivalence and ambiguity um, surrounding them there. Another key aspect of invisibility or visibility <coughs> is um, economic, and particularly invisible, um, well, what I've called invisible workers. Latin Americans <coughs> form a key part of what we in the Global Cities uh, at Work research called a migrant division of labour. And that basically is where um, low-paid um, migrants end up working in low-paid jobs in the labour market. You have a few working in high paid jobs at the top, but the vast majority of the low paid works, uh, jobs are filled by migrants. Latin Americans have very, very high employment rates. The, nas the, the national average in the 2011 census is, is about 60%. So you can see that Latin Americans have very high, high rates of employment. But they are concentrated in what we call <coughs> elementary jobs, especially in cleaning. This is often invisible work. This is work in the morning, it takes place really early in the morning. They clean offices, work for big contract cleaning companies, men and women together, um, uh, in, in, in the early morning and in the evening. So it's very fragmented work. We've got an example here of an Ecuadorian who actually has three different jobs. Um, he works in the morning, four to seven, then nine to five, and then seven to ten. And again, very, very important is that this, uh, the, the case of Miriam here talks about the fact that London without Latins would be filthy. And an interesting, an interesting point is actually, and I, I discovered this a few years ago, that um, apparently uh, Tony Blair's number 10 used to have a Colombian cleaner. And Tony Blair used to talk to, to this Colombian cleaner in terms of his insights into life as a migrant in, in London. So economic invisibility can be quite useful for irregular migrants. But what I've tried to show is it also reflects a deep neglect and a lack of recognition of their, their contribution to how London actually functions. So over 40% experience workplace abuses and 11% earn less than the, the national um, minimum wage. 75% in more recent work that, that we've done um, earn less than the living wage. Also incredibly important, and this comes back to this idea of language that I mentioned earlier, is that Latin Americans are generally a very um, educated um, group. You know, they're, they're not also one, one community, but as a general rule, they're, they're, they're well educated. 60%, according to the census, are educated to tertiary and university level. However, because only one in five, um, or one in five can't speak very good English, this results in downward occupational mobility. And um, if you look at the, the, the green columns here, we can see that only 2% of people back home actually worked in cleaning jobs. 
In Spain, Portugal and Italy, only 12%. This goes up to 66% on their first arrival in London. Now, there's some sort of mobility in, at the time of survey. It's gone down a bit to 50. But really, you know, that's still half the population working in low-paid um, low elementary work. Thinking socially, then, um, there's, there's more ambivalence. Um, and some people argue that, that um, being invisible, so being able to speak English, um, not, not displaying sort of outward signs of your Latin Americanness, basically means that, that you are incorporated. It's also been shown in other contexts, particularly in the work on Latinos in the US and, and Spain, that visibility can also be dangerous. It can lead to stereotyping. It can lead to discrimination. And actually... In the no longer invisible work, 70% of Latin Americans talked about experiencing discrimination. The more recent work, which is with just the onward migrants coming from other European countries, it was, it was lower, but it's still very significant. It's more than a third. And so what we get, and I think this is also comes across in the, in, in the two quotations from a Venezuelan who's actually a a very well-qualified engineer who's actually working in a well-qualified job. But he still talked about um, discrimination in the workplace. But on the other hand, Nicholas from Colombia said, recognised the fact that London is a city of immigrants and that you start to feel, feel at home. There, there is a tolerance um, about living in London. Also something that, again, I've... Um, feel very strongly about and has certainly been a theme in terms of my sort of intellectual journey has been looking at gender inequalities and uh, in particular uh, I, I did some work looking at this idea of migrant machismos and again this is very much in relation to um, the collaboration with the Latin American Women's Rights Service um, who, who say have been the key partners in the, in the two largest projects that I've, I've, I've been doing but it's really about thinking about how ideologies change across borders. So how do gender ideologies change? How do what we call hegemonic masculinities and femininities change? What the, 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 the work has shown is that on the one hand, there are gains. Women actually experience improvements in their lives. Elena talks about the fact that her cleaning job, she feels valued in her cleaning job. She didn't feel valued in her cleaning job, um, uh, actually in her hairdressing job, um, back in La Paz in Bolivia. However, um, there are also other issues, and particularly important, violence against women and girls. Approximately, and we don't have the, the data on this, approximately one in four Latin American women um, have experienced gender-based violence in the home. Um, this is also the subject of some really exciting new research that we've just started, which again is very collaborative, and it's with the People's Palace Project and the Department of English and Drama here at Queen Mary, also with the Latin American Women's Rights Service and the Casa Latin American Theatre Festival, and also with the Federal University um, of Rio and the um, Redes de Marais. And we're looking at the, the transnational interpretations of violence against women and girls amongst Brazilians in London and also in, in Rio. So I'm looking forward to, to really getting going on that project in the next 18 months. More, I've mentioned this project, and again, it, it relates to this idea of linkages between Latin America and, and the UK, although this project also included Spain. And there, this relates to the voting project um, and, and the ways in which Colombians are allowed to vote and the nature of this voting when they can vote back home. And again, another um, PhD student of mine, Anastasia Bermudez, and we worked on this together after Anastasia had finished, and came up with this idea of ambivalent citizenship. And this relates to the way in which the Colombian state really wants to capture um, often the remittances, but the so-called power of Colombians, the Colombian diaspora living abroad. But actually, Colombians, in this case in London and, and Spain, weren't actually that interested in voting. There were very, very low turnout rates in relation to voting back home. Um, and the people who did vote were invariably the professional, middle class um, and, and wealthy migrants. And in, 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 in many ways... More important was the way in which citizenship is practised um, in, in the everyday, and particularly in relation to civil society and civic participation. And this leads me on to the politics. 
and the politics of visibility and invisibility. And the idea that there is a politics of presence. Um, Jonathan Darling has come up with this idea of, he, he, didn't, he hasn't called it ambiguous politics of presence, but he talks about the ways in which, on the one hand, visibility is essential. And I would argue this as well in relation to Latin Americans. It is essential to actually document who is living in a, in a country, in a city. But there are also um, um, dangers at the individual level in relation to those who don't have papers, which I've been talking about. And there has been a lot of, uh, of work, say, as long as I've been working with the Latin American community, um, on, on creating um, what's called sort of ethnic recognition. The first... The first um, um, effort and sort of mobilising, collective mobilising, was around the Ibero-American Alliance and then the Latin American Recognition Campaign. Then, linked with the No Longer Invisible report, um, the Coalition of Latin Americans in the UK was, was set up and they then continued the campaign and have, it's resulted at the local um, borough level in London of the recognition of Latin Americans on ethnic monitoring forms um, at, the, so at the local government level. In Southwark, Lambeth, Islington and Hackney with ongoing campaigns in Haringey, Newham and Brent. And here we've got Chuka Amuna saying how important Latin Americans are and how important it is to officially recognise them. So the, the, the benefits, there are benefits of recognition in terms of accessing resources and social protection and also in developing a pan-ethnic identity. But there are also drawbacks. Um, there is stereotyping. There's essentialising what is a huge continent with lots of internal diversity, lots, of, lots and lots of different characteristics, um, which is really essentialising in many ways. It can also lead to racism. It can lead to discrimination. But in terms of, of thinking about the, the, the future of, of what I've called Latin London... There's been some interesting work by Mike Davis who talks about magical urbanism in the US and the role that Latinization has had on cities in North America and the importance of the Latino population, which is obviously much larger in the US than it is in the UK. But I think there's sort of interesting, interesting things to think about in, in the context of how we think about the future of the British city. Uh, city. What I would argue, and again this leads on to the, the final part of my sort of intellectual journey, is I would argue that it's very important that we also think about this in terms of cultural production. And um, I've, I've worked on, on say, in the, last, in the last few years, probably sort of five years, increasingly in terms of work, I've worked more with the arts. This project was... Um, uh, a photography, a portrait photography uh, project um, that Catherine Davis um, started, uh, and she's now, it was when she was at the University of Nottingham and is now at um, the Institute of Modern Languages with Roxana and Pablo Allison, who are Me Anglo Mexican photographers. And this is a wonderful portrait, um, a set of portraits of every single part, sorry, one person from every single country in Latin America. And they used the No Longer Invisible work and called it Uncovering the Invisible. And they had a whole series of, of exhibitions around the UK, actually. Um, another interesting project, again, moving into the arts and moving into um, um, uh, this, uh, the cultural production and cultural visibility of Latin Americans, is a play that was developed by... Um, uh, a Mexican playwright and actress, Vicky Araico Casas and Nia Paldi, initially supported by the Casa Latin American Theatre Festival, drawing on the work of Loris and No Longer Invisible. And this portrayed the life of a Mexican migrant in London. And it was a really, really powerful play. And we had a symposium around that where we reflected on, on what this really means for, for migration more widely. And also the use of the arts in terms of really making people understand what it is to be a migrant in a, in a city like London, which is uh, incredibly politically important, I think, um, today, um, more than ever, I think. The final project that I'll actually just say something about is an ongoing project um, on Latin American, the Latin American community and the arts, which is with Kavita, Kavita Data, who's the director of the Centre for the Study of Migration and the CASA Latin American Theatre Festival. 
And this is a project looking at the way in which cultural activities and the performing arts is linked with identities of Latin Americans, but particularly with um, integration processes. And I think this is incredibly um, interesting in that, um, and I only, only looked at this very, really recently, this, this project is not finished yet, and uh, I think it's very interesting in terms of thinking about what Raul, who's an Ecuadorian, talks about, and the importance of the arts in his own integration processes. And he talks about how he now believes more in himself and his own culture because he is, he is, he is afar. He is, he is, is, is um, um, looking at his own culture from a distance. And I think, and I've highlighted this myself, he says, they help me feel as a person, rescuing me from invisibility. And it's filled me with happiness. It's helped me to integrate satisfactorily. So I think, again, there's some really interesting ways that we can think about cultural production, as well as economic and social and political production, in relation to the city and migration. Okay, you'll be glad to hear that this is actually my final slide. And I want to return to the song that I started with, and the song that you heard at the very beginning of the lecture. And before I do that, there's sort of two quotations that I, I think sort of sum up, hopefully, what I've been talking um, about tonight. The first is by the Mexican feminist, Gloria Anzaldúa, who talks about, in relation to her book, The Borderlands, she talks about um, the, the process of migration. She wants to feel freedom to carve and chisel my own face. Um, if going home is denied me, I'll have to stand and claim my space, making a new culture with my own lumber, my bricks and mortar, and my own feminist architecture. Then, the final quotation that I think is incredibly important is Augusto Boal, a Brazilian, infamous Brazilian, um, who talks about, we are all actors, being a citizen is not living in a society, but changing a society. So I want to finish, finish off the, the, um, the lecture by showing uh, a small clip that Mark Evans has, has, has made for me, a promotional clip from the documentary film, which um, includes the voices particularly of Yelitsa, the Venezuelan, on which the song is actually, um, is actually based. And I say I will finish with this if I can get the film clip to actually work. 